Please stand as you are able for the reading of God's word. Psalm 17 through 17 through 18. Since my youth, God, you have taught me, and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, my God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your mighty acts to all who are to come. May God in his bless may God add his blessing to the reading, hearing and doing of his word. Amen. Take it, Tim. Thank you. You can keep it. You may be seated. Thank you for doing that. I love when different folks get up and do the reading. Um, and we're going to come back to that verse at the end. But we're going to we're in a series called Vital Christianity, and today we're going to look at something called Life Two Halves: a look back and a look ahead. And it's been <laughs> very interesting. Uh, some of the conversations that I've been having already this morning. But before I get into that, I just wanted to um, give you a quick announcement that I asked you to be praying for us. We had a meeting here at Highlander, and um, it, it was just fantastic. I can't explain to you how, I, I, how cool it is to be forming a relationship with the folks here at Highlander and the students. Um, I'm actually going to be able to um, start a, a fitness club. And so I'm going to be coming into the school uh, two days one week and three days the next. And just being able to, it's going to be like an elective. So some of the kids here at the school can take an elective. And, and it's just, to me, a, a good first step for me to get into the school, to be able to meet the kids, get to know them, and, and then just kind of see where it goes, you know. Um, and then we had a great discussion about the mentoring and internship. And many of you know about that. If you don't, um, please feel free to come up to me after. We can talk more about it. But they, um, they have a great program here already where they match up students with mentors. And uh, they're trying to figure out the, the pathway for these students to take, whether it's through college or through career, and to give them the best opportunity to, to land a good paying job. And so I've been networking with a bunch of people in this church and in our communities, um, business folks especially, and saying, are there opportunities for, for students that are here when they're in their junior and senior years to come and do an internship with us and be mentored? And so I gave them a list of about 40 people. Um, so that's phenomenal if you think about it, you know, just to have 40 people from basically this church and, and a little bit of expansion outside of here. Uh, and they were blown away by that. So I just feel like, you know, there's a lot of great opportunities ahead of us and we'd love to get more and more people involved. I kind of look at myself as a kind of like networking. So like if you know someone, you might not own your own business, but maybe you know somebody, please come up to me and let me know if this is something where people want to give back to that next generation and help them uh, kind of break the cycle. If you're stuck in inner city Providence, you know, there's a vicious cycle there. So we're trying to work hard to, to help break that. So I'd love to um, continue to learn more about different folks that might want to do that. Exciting, right? Good stuff. All right. Um, so in this series, to look back and to look to, to look ahead, it's been very interesting to me. Um, I'm 44 years old, and I, I did a little bit of research. So the uh, the average uh, age of expectancy here in the United States is 79. All right. So I didn't realize this, but I'm on the other side of it. I'm on the other half. I was like, I was going to talk from a different perspective this morning. I'm like, oh shoot, I'm on this half, <laughs> right? So. That was kind of scary. Uh, I don't think that way. Um, but it was so funny because when I, uh, this week, so a friend of mine from school put up a picture on Facebook from when I was 13 years old. I'm like, oh my gosh. First of all, I was wearing an Iron Maiden shirt. And secondly, it was like a cutoff. I'm like, what is going on? Right? I was like, what was I thinking? What was my mother thinking? Let me go to school, you know, like that. But, you know, but what it made me think about was obviously youthfulness, right? Like, um, you, you're kind of like you feel like you got your whole life ahead of you and you're invincible. But a lot of people didn't know. And this kind of it really hit me. Um, that picture was taken, I'm assuming, when I was in eighth grade and when I was 13 years old, because I noticed I didn't have my scar for my tracheotomy. And that's probably one of the first pictures I've seen besides like when I was a baby. You know what I mean? I don't like, look at pictures when I was a teenager. You know what I mean? I don't really have a lot of them. And when I saw that picture, I was like, oh, my gosh. You don't have a scar. And that means that within months of that picture being taken, I woke up one day and I was completely paralyzed. And it was a life-changing experience that I had. And it was just like, wow, it just brought me back to 1985 in a hurry. Um, and and it's a, it was a great reminder, though, because now as a 44-year-old, I look back and I say, man, as a 13-year-old, you thought 
you could do anything and you were invincible and you woke up one day and couldn't stand up. And by five o'clock that night, you were on a respirator having to be fully, you know, uh, enabled by a respirator and unable to move anything but your left eye. And obviously I went through a four and a half month period of being in the hospital and coming out the other side of that. But, but it made me think like how, how life is fragile. And so I'm going to be talking to two halves of people today. Like I want you to go back. If you're in the under 40, how many people do we have under 40? Raise your hand. <laughs> Without lying. Hold on. All right. Under 40. All right. How many people are over 40? All right. So I'm going to speak to both halves. And it was so funny. I must have been speaking to a lot of the over 40s on the way because I'm walking. I'm like, ah, oh, my back is hurting. My wife's back is hurting. Terry's an anomaly 16 and his back's hurting. So I'm like, yes, it's not because of my age. Lenny's back is hurting. Gary's elbow is hurting. You know, and I'm like, oh, man. And <laughs> I'm supposed to wait till after to share the story, but it feels like apropos now. I go to the, I go to the gym, right, and it's at Health Tracks. <laughs> and sometimes it's like an old man's club. Right, so I'm, li I'm sitting in the locker room, and I'm sitting there going, I should not be hearing this stuff. Like, all they talk about, right, they're all half naked, they're all got their bellies eight, they're all balding, right? And they're, all they talk about is their hospital visits, you know, and I'm like, oh, my good Lord, right? And I'm just hearing things like, <laughs> is that what I got to look forward to, right, really? And then I'm going to share this in public, right? So, like, I'm, like, just taking care of myself, you know, in this, I'm, like, listening, oh, my gosh, but every day, seriously, when I go there, it's, it's like a medical thing just laid out before us. But it's kind of sad, too, because I'm sitting there going, is that really all there is? And for many people, that's what it looks like, right? So, like, I want to stop that. So if, if you're in your first half of life right now, under 40, there's things that we need to be doing now to prepare us for <laughs> later because it gets a lot harder you know what I mean? Ask the 60-year-olds that wants to lose weight. It's like, oh, my gosh, it's very, very difficult. It's hard at 30, never mind at 60, right? But we have to – there's things that we can make investments now that will help us long term. And that's – I really want to talk a little bit about that because I feel like, gosh, if I had known certain pieces of information, you know, when I was 16, 20, 30 years old, that it truly could have, you know, changed the path and helped me in my second half of life, which I find myself in, I guess. Um, so I asked myself, what's that? Yeah. Oh, well, no, no, yeah, we'll, we'll get to both sides. we got to speak to both sides. No, that's a great point. Stephanie, <laughs> Stephanie said, I hope you have good news for us, because if we're already in the, in the 40s and 50s, and we didn't invest already, what are we going to do? It's never too late to start. That's my first word of advice. Um, but my question that I challenged myself was like, how am I, how did I do? So that, to your point, it's like, how did you do in your first half? What were the, the decisions that you were making as a 20 year old, a 30 year old that now you're going, oh shoot, I wish I didn't make that. Or your vice versa, you say, you know, I'm so glad I made these decisions when I was young because now they're really paying dividends. And so just be thinking about that because I want us to learn from the different generations this morning. So we will do a little open mic thing, and I want you to be thinking about what are the life lessons that you've learned? You know, if you're 50 and older, I, I really have a desire to be an intergenerational church, you know, and I, I want all age groups to be able to learn from one another. And this is a great way, if, if you've li lived life, whether you've made good or bad decisions, you've learned from them, and you have a lot to offer to the, to the next generations beyond us. So um, just be thinking about that. And I want to start with a great quote from, um, it's a Robert Browning poem. It says, grow old along with me. The best is yet to be. The last of life for which the first was made. Our times are in his hand, who saith, a whole I planned. Youth shows but half. Trust God, see all, nor be afraid. That's the good news. This is a perspective type of poem because do you really believe that the best is yet to come? There, I believe there is. You know, and, and obviously, yes, if you're under 40 and there's things you can do to make those investments now, by all means, soak this up, pay attention, and start making these changes now. If you're on the other side of that, 
understand that you can make decisions today that will get you to that next step and be able to enjoy the rest of life, and it can be the best of your life. I really believe that, and we'll talk at all different ways. So let me look at the first half first, okay? The first investment, um, these are the things that if we do these things, it should set us up for the second half. And it reminded me of the story of the talents, right? You remember the story of the talents? Some were given five, some were given three, some were given one. And, and God was really in favor of those that took the five and they invested them, right? And they took it and, and, and doubled it. And then they took the three and they doubled that. But then the one played it safe and didn't invest it. And he talked about being a wicked servant, and, and so this idea of taking what God has put in our lives and investing it is a biblical principle. And if we get it, it will shape the rest of our lives. So let me ask the older generation this question, these two questions. So if you're over 50, you don't have to be over 50 to answer, but somewhere in there. I did that before I recognized I was on the second half. <laughs> <laughs> what do you worry about the most? And then what do you wish you had done differently in the first half of your life in order to make the second half better? Oh, my gosh, you weren't kidding. No, just kidding. <laughs> I want to see you go face to face. I, I might have a little bit different take, so is that okay? Would you please? Because you're under 50, and, you know, it was really depressing when he asked me if you're over 50, you know, could you share? So after 24 hours of serious depression, note to self, check into Botox, um, I, I decided I could speak to you. But um, so he asked, so the lessons I've learned that I wish I had have done in the first half of life, that I didn't really start in the second half, so I'll tell you right here, wear sunscreen every day. Um, so that when you're over 50, somebody might not say to you, would you share because you're over 50? Um, <laughs> um, don't make the same mistake twice. That's an important one. Don't believe everything you hear. Um, practice forgiveness. And I say practice because it is a should be a practice of your life, but you have to practice it in order to do it on a regular basis. Um, and exercise your mind, your body, your spirit, your soul, and your patience. So with all of these people that are hurting in here, we're going to have a little exercise stretching class afterwards. Um, and read every day, Colossians 3, 12 through 15. I'll write, so he can send it to you on email. I'm not going to read it to you now. With 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7, read it often, start now, um, talks about being kind and loving others and forgiving and making allowance for one another's faults, and then it talks about what love looks like. Um, and then sort of to all of us, this is where I'm a little bit different, I think, Sean, I, I, I can't go back, I've had to learn, what if didn't happen, I should have didn't happen. I cannot live in that place. It didn't happen. And so like the Apostle Paul, I have to say, forgetting what is behind and pressing on towards the future. I want to live in the present, always be willing to listen, always be willing to grow, and always be willing to change. I'm willing to listen. Hebrews 3 says, when 3 7 says when you hear God's voice do not harden your hearts my translation do not ignore it um, and then in Acts it says the Holy Spirit fell on those who were listening to the message listen to the message um, and then be willing to grow Ephesians 1 17 says ask God da, 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 I won't read the whole thing to give you spiritual wisdom which is defined in James 3 17 and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God and obviously in order to grow in your knowledge of God you've got to spend alone time on a very frequent basis I would suggest daily um, with God and that's something that I didn't do at your age, and I probably didn't do at somebody else's age, maybe yours. <laughs> but it took me until probably my 30s before I started doing that on a regular basis. I did, I bless you. See, I, I'm much better at that than Sean. <laughs> I 
I, I understand these things. And change. Um, Colossians 1, 16, the good news is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. And so that my life will always be changing for Christ in a way that honors him because God forbid if I stop growing, if I stop listening, if I stop changing, I may as well be dead. And that verse about old and gray, please. <laughs> that was great. Thank you, Cindy. All right, we're good. Everyone can go home now. All right, so rather quickly, Alan, did you want to say something? Go ahead, Will. Hold on. Hold on, hold on, hold on. What I'm most worried about is being relevant at this age. In my 20s, I was a woman's minister, and I was touching a lot of people's lives, and people were interested in what God was saying through me. In my 60s, my, I, my biggest fear is that I'm not going to be relevant and, and that I'm going to die mm. without doing what God had put me on this earth to do. And, you know, it's funny. One of the things that God's really been talking to me a lot about is that <clears throat> we used to think that all these silly little things mattered to God, like what, you know, words you say, you know, don't say fantastic because that's derivative of this and crazy stuff. I mean, we worried about silly stuff. And we stopped living, you know, and we, you know, you got, I got caught up in all the little logistics and stopped living. And one of the things that God said to me was the biggest, his biggest loss with us is when we stop living. He can deal with mistakes. He can deal with problems. But, he, but if we choose to not continue to live a full life, then we've cut him short. Great, thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. This idea of, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that. There's no time for retirement in God. Like, he wants to continue to use us. And to me, that's why the best years are yet ahead, because you've learned and you've lived life, and then we can give back. Um, anyone just quickly, just raise, we don't even need a mic for this. Raise your hand. What, what are the things you worry about? Just quickly. Go ahead, Lori. Our children's future, great. What else? What are some other worries? What is it? Finance. Thank you. All right. Now, lead me into now. What else? Finances. Absolutely. Health. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So not, you know, running out of money and then you become a burden to your family, etc. cetera. Um, all great points. Those are, those are the types of things that when they do the studies on this, that's the top two things is health and finances when they did a bunch of studies on asking folks uh, in the latter half of life. So let me talk about finances for a second. And again, this is for those in that first half of life because, again, if I had known these things, it would have changed my life. And I'll give you some concrete examples. But first, let me start with this. It's a quote from Thomas Merton. It said, people may spend their whole lives climbing the ladder of success only to find, once they reach the top, that the ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. If you've had this as, you, as your experience, and you're an older person, wouldn't it be great to have a conversation with a 25-year-old and say, here's what I've learned? You know what I mean? Think about that. If we're going to be an intergenerational church, we've got to figure out how to have conversations all across the way here because it's pivotal. And sometimes we think that um, if our life doesn't look perfect on this side of things, we have nothing to give. And I, I couldn't disagree more. It's in those times that you've come out the other side and you keep plowing away and you keep going at it that you can then talk to someone because life you now have a, a life full of wisdom to share with the next generation. I, I kind of put... I wish I had like a, a big, tall thing that I could climb a ladder and just keep climbing because I am climbing. I'm climbing and I'm climbing and I'm climbing. And, and youth, that's a great thing. You know, when you're 25, 30 years old and you want to climb that corporate ladder and you want to be ambitious and all that, all good stuff. But what are you leaving behind as you're climbing? Because if we're climbing this ladder and it's all about me, who am I leaving behind? 
who have I tossed off the ladder to continue to rise on that ladder? So here's what the scripture says in Luke 12. And he said to them, watch out. I love that. Like that's an exclamation point. Watch out and guard yourselves against every form of greed. For a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So a lot of times we're climbing, 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 trying to get more and more and more and more. And we don't realize that actually it's bec we're becoming less and less and less. So there's this thing. A lot of people don't like what I'm about to say, but I feel it's, it's important to say it. I'm a big guy. I, I think we need to have balance in our lives. And a lot of times when I talk to people about that, they don't like that. You can't have balance in your life. And I go, yeah, I get that. But we need balance in our life. Yeah, we need. So there's, this, there's a tension in that when I say that. And I recognize both sides of that, okay? So I'm not being naive when I say this. But I heard someone just the other day talk about this, and I thought it was brilliant. But before I get to that, I want you to understand, you're climbing that ladder. God is all about working hard. Okay, it talks in Proverbs all about this idea that, yes, we are built and wired to work. So work hard, right? When you're at work, give it everything that you have. Ask God to bless you and make a difference while you're at work. But at the same time, play hard. That means spend time with your spouse if you're married. Spend time with your friends if you're single. Spend time with your kids if you have them, right? We have to try to figure out the juggling act. And that's exactly what it is. So I, I heard T.D. Jakes the other day, and I loved what he said. T.D. Jakes is a, a, a pastor in, in Texas. He has a huge ministry, writes a lot of books, just very, very wise man. He said this. He says, you know what? In a week, I have all these different things going on. He's got like many. He, he runs a 40,000-person church. That's just one thing. He runs this business, this business, this business. He's got this ministry, this ministry, this ministry. He's all over a lot. He's got a wife. He's got kids, right? So... He says, you know what? It was exactly what Cindy said. Don't make the same mistake twice in the same week. So he goes, you know what? Today, maybe I had to work a lot. And that ball I was juggling and I did very well there, but maybe I missed out with the spouse. Well, tomorrow, just make sure I don't miss out with the spouse again. But you know what? Maybe work has to kind of take a little bit of a side. And, and you keep juggling, okay? So I really like that because as you're growing up and you're, you're, you're in the discovery phase, you're trying to learn about who you are, what's important to you, what's your purpose, all these different things. So keep and try to figure it out in balance. Because if you get driven by money, 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 greed and greed and greed, eventually it will catch up to you. So let me talk a little bit about that. And if you're in the baby boomer generation, I didn't know this, but there's a retirement crisis going on. And the statistics show that only 15% of the baby boomers invested well in their early years okay so they invested well in their early years so now they're okay only 15 percent 35 percent did it okay but most people were living as if they were never going to live past 50. so 50 percent of baby boomers do not have enough to live on right now that's a crisis so obviously for me as a pastor i don't want that to happen to our young people okay so i want you to listen I want you to be part of that 15%. And it starts with saving now. We teach a 10, 10, 80 lifestyle. Okay. 10%, the first 10% goes back to God giving the second 10%. You pay yourself savings and then live off the rest. 80%. If you start by doing that, I'm telling you what, if you talk to people that are, are giving 10% of their money, they never miss it. It's like, I can't believe how faithful it is for the people that I know that have tithed regularly. It's not like a burden. It's a joy. And that's what the Bible talks about. Be a joyful giver. The next 10% is where a lot of people struggle and we don't ever think about it because we're chasing, 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 climbing, climbing, climbing. So we don't have time to save for the future. We're not even thinking about it. What does 50 look like when you're 25? But I'm going to tell you that if you don't do it, Talk to people, and I'm not going to put you on the spot here, but I'm sure there's people in this room that fit that boomer, the baby boomer generation and are struggling with the 50%. You know, you're in that place, 60, 70 years old, and you're like, oh, man, and it's not easy. And it's not how God intended it to be. Because if we follow his principles to, to give 10%, to save 10%, live off the rest, I, I think that for the most part, we would be okay in our later years. 
So start saving in your 20s. And I want to give you an example because I feel like it's, it's fairly simple if we'll convince ourselves to do it. So if you save $200 a month, just $2,400 a year, I just did some little research. If you did that when you were 25 years old and you did that until you were 68, which is basically a savings. I don't know if that sounds strange to you, but Diane and I did that. I don't know if we were 20 in our 20s or 30s when we started, but we started that. So it's very doable is what I'm getting at. It's, uh, and we had a very small income. So I, I just feel like I can testify to like it's, it's very, very doable. You know, raising three kids, all the things you would think about, right? Uh, not on a big salary. And yet finding that carve out that thing, give 10% and save 10%. And, and so if you do that, right, the statistics show with a return that's average at best that you would be a millionaire at 68 because you have the, the power of compound interest on your side. Think about that. If you just made that a habit when you were 20 years old, 25 years old, and, and, and I have a terrible depressing story. You're talking, you were depressed, I'm depressed. So my depression is when I, when I signed uh, baseball out of high school, I was 18 years old, and I signed a professional contract. I got $50,000 cash, and I got 15000 in a school fund. So I got my schooling all paid for. It was great. So after I was done with baseball, I went to PC, graduated five years, and paid $1,000. woo great. What happened to that 50000 Huh, 18 years old. <laughs> this gets depressing in a hurry. So the first 25000 I wanted a new Mustang GT convertible, yada, yada. Great. No longer have that car. <laughs> Long gone. Um, then there was a get, what is it, a quick fix, get rich quick scheme type thing. $25,000. Here you go. Thought I was going to make it big, rich, 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 going to be set for life. That $25,000, gone. You know what I did? I was like, oh, I'm 44 years old. If I had invested, I was 18. If I took that $25,000, I had invested it at 8%, just one time, boom. 8% over 40 years. They say you average 10% in the, in the market over a 40-year period of time. So <laughs> I go, if I was at this age, at 44 years old, I would have $180,000 if I had just put it in the bank, not touched it, not done anything, just put it in the bank. And then I said, wow, what if I didn't touch that? That could be part of my retirement plan. At 68 years old, it would be a million dollars. I would never have done another thing if I had just taken $25,000, put it in the, in the stock market and let it ride its course for the next 40, 50 years, and my retirement would have been set. So when those older folks come around you and say, hey, you know what? You got that nice gift. Why don't you invest it? Why don't you save it? Listen. <laughs> Listen. Okay? So that principle is a life-saving principle, the 10-10-80 principle. So I just hope that you hear that loud and clearly. The second investment, so that was the first investment with our finances. The second investment, like we talked about, was our health. And I'm not going to talk a lot about this. I think we know it up here. It's just harder to do. If you need help with that, we do have folks in here, including myself and others, that are into fitness and would love to help you. Um, but you know what? It's not just, it's both um, sleep patterns, fitness, and nutrition. And their habits. So when you're in your 20s and 30s and 40s, if you do these things now, I'm telling you later, because I've, I've seen you know, and heard the stories of those that are in their 60s and 70s, and it just becomes that much more difficult. All right. Good on health. We got it, right? That's a good one. We don't have to spend time on it. Invest now. The third investment is the importance of relationships. You know, this is, um, this is very important to me because, again, I, we didn't really touch on this, but when you get to the 70s and 80s, or even 60s, 70s, 80s, and you don't have a social life, because at that point, you probably have a lot more time on your hands. But if you don't have really good people in your life that you can do life with, then you get very, very lonely. And then the days are very long. And then, to Aline, to your point, what, what am I doing? What's my purpose? How can I give back? And, man, I'm telling you, as a church, I hope that this becomes a place where you see value in yourselves and that you have a place to give back into other people's lives. It's like, I want to give you permission. I don't have to, right? I shouldn't have to, but I want to. If you're in this uh, second phase, of, like I give myself permission. You're 44, Sean, give back. You got to start talking to 20, 30-year-olds with a person in, with experience. Okay, you've lived enough life. I've been married for 22 years. I've done all these different things. 
you have enough to give back to the next generation. I give you permission. Start investing in others. The importance of relationships. Now think about life. Young couples, when you have children, it's so hard to have time to build friendships. I see this happen all the time with young families. And all of a sudden they go through the first five years of marriage just struggling because they haven't figured out the juggling act. And how important it is, especially in those early years, to have people in your life that you can trust that have been there, done that, can offer you wisdom and advice, can be there to help babysit, all the different things. But it's absolutely critical to do that. Um, what do you think? Marriage. This was an eye-opener. <laughs> when I thought of marriage, I thought 20 years was like a solid marriage. That was a long period of time. And I started thinking, about like, I'm not even at the halfway point. I'm just starting. Right? If, if I'm supposed to live till I'm 80, I got a long way to go. So my marriage right now is the infancy stage. We've been married... I'm messing this up on it's like 23 years, <laughs> 22, best 22 years of my life. Um, what do you think, um, which part of your marriage do you think is best, the first 20 or the last 20? All right, let's say first 20, raise your hand. First 20 years of your marriage, do you think that's the best? I know you've only been not, not married 20, so you're like, yeah, it's good. <laughs> if, you're in, if, you're not <laughs> all right, if you've only been married 10, 15 years, you're not raising your hand, there's something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's been the best 15 years of my life. <laughs> 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 Who thinks it's the, the past 20 years? You guys don't want to think about it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, it's all a ch Well, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Why not? Why not? Um, no, I mean, we're, we've been married. It'll be, you know, it's nine and a half years. It's not, it's not that long in the scheme of things. And, and we've had, there's been definitely some bumps and things in there. But as time goes on, we get more and more comfortable. It, you just, we're able, we're, we're still learning about marriage even. And I think that it's inevitable if you've done that part right. If you're, current, if you're constantly investing on the first half <laughs> of your marriage, just like in the first half of your life, the second half, you're going to have wisdom that you didn't have. You're going to always be gaining that. I, I, I look forward to, I've had a great time now. I look forward to having a fantastic, I mean, I, I just look forward to it being even better just as it goes on. It's like a snowball, great. but a good way. Good. Will, <laughs> the fun kind. Come on, Will. Will, come on. <laughs> what I want you to think about, um, if you've been married for a while, tell me, or it doesn't matter how long you've been married, but why do you think, why do you think it would be better on the second half? Steph hit on a little bit, but I want to see if anyone's thought this through. There's just some built-in practicality. Francis? Because I think it's so important for us to get. Like Sometimes we, we just like let things go right over our heads, and we don't think about there's just certain realities. I think the second half for now is a lot better because I've grown and matured. It was very difficult at first um, because I had a lot of adjusting and learning to do. Uh -huh. I like how you said I. That's great. Most people say him. <laughs> <laughs> I like how you took ownership of that. <laughs> okay. um, what I have to say is very similar to what Francis said. Um, just like Francis, I had a lot of growing to do. So from the get-go, this guy had it going. But I was way immature. Different circumstances, different ways you grow, you know, grow up, and um, different things that happen to you. Um, but along the road, you have these problems, and it's how you deal with the problems that develop a better relationship. And I wish I had known that in the first 20 but I'm devoted to it in the last 20. Great, thank you. You know, one of the things that I wrestle with is like when I talk to especially young girls, there's the, um, just keep it with you. No, sit down, but keep it with you. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you never know, Will. <laughs> this, and if you want to share something, go ahead. <laughs> um, 
what does a 13 year old have to say? <laughs> um, this idea that when you first get married, uh, usually the first two years, if it's difficult, some people's marriage ends in the first two years. I don't know if, if you know the statistics, but it goes the first two years and then it goes periods of seven, seven, 14, 21, 28, right? Um, usually in the first two years, it's just because you're two strangers, right? You thought you're, you're in love with each other, you've been dating, and all of a sudden you live together, and you're like, oh my gosh, you live like that? Like, who did I wake up to, you know what I mean? And so you're learning that, and you don't know how to communicate, you don't know how to pick up after yourself, you don't know basically anything, right? So if you get through the first two years, it means you navigated that, you figured it out, you learned to pick up, you learned to do the roles, responsibilities, etc. Then you have kids. Now, obviously, I love kids, right? But just the reality of having children takes you in all different directions, and it takes a lot of our energy, right? We only have X amount of energy to do in life, and so we give energy to work. We give energy to our spouse, and we give energy to our, um, to our children, etc. But a lot of times what happens is if we're not juggling well, who gets cut out? The sp who? Yourself, okay. Who else? Spouse. Your spouse. I was going to say your spouse. I understand when you say yourself too, because you there's a there's a built-in sacrifice when you get married. You start saying I'm no longer single, so it's not about me. But what I usually find happens is that the spouse gets left out because we're so focused on the children. All right. So then what happens? Play that out because it's the kids, 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 kids. We're not really investing in our marriage, and all of a sudden, 20 years in. I see so many people get divorced 20 to 25 years, and at first I was blown away by that. I'm like, I don't get it. But then it made perfect sense. The kids are now out of the house, and we have no idea how to be best friends anymore because we stopped being best friends for, for 20 years. We became, you know, bedfellows, right? Like, oh, you know, great. Nice to see you. We're like roommates, okay? Because we're tired, so whatever. So anyways, you understand. We don't have time for each other, right? And to, to meet each other's needs and things like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See? Very good. Not too late. <laughs> so this idea is that if we invest in those early years in marriage, to me, absolutely, the next 20, 30, 40 years, they, the statistics, they've done studies, show that your relationship post that, getting past the 2025 year mark, is the best years of marriage. And I like saying that because say you're struggling right now. You're in five years, ten years, and you're struggling. It's like, hang in there. Keep figuring it out. Obviously, make some adjustments. I'm going to share with you very quickly. In the first half, what can you do? And you've heard me say this, and I'll always keep saying this, so I'm a broken record, but date regularly, whatever that looks like. In carve out time for just the two of you. Weekend getaways. I meet so many couples, and I say, when's the last time you took a vacation, just the two of you? And I don't care if it's a two-day, three-day excursion. It doesn't have to be two weeks. And I'm telling you, people, 10 years, 20 years, I'm like, oh, my gosh. So if that's you, plan a weekend getaway. The daily check-in conversations. This is how you build your friendship. How's your day? Most men aren't good at this. We need help with this. Okay? So... Write it down. I'm terrible. I'm a compartmentalized thinker. What happened at 9 a.m., I don't remember by 11 a.m. So when she asked me how my day was, it was like, what happened in the last half hour? It was good. It was bad. You know, I was like, I have no idea, right? S but women use a lot more words than men, right? There's like this thing. We need, guys need to get better at this. So like sometimes I'll just keep it on my phone. She just said, Sean, you didn't tell me that. Like we were in a conversation yesterday at a party at my mom's house, and there was relatives there, and I'm like, oh, and I'm telling them all this great stuff that's happening. She's looking at me like, <laughs> so I've been married 22 years, so as I'm sharing, I'm like, oh, crap. So I give her the eye contact. I'm like, honey, this is for you right now, right? I, I'm, we're in it. So listen up, because I didn't share this with you, but I should have, and I know, but it's okay. And here, listen, right? And we can talk about it more later. Oh, boy, right? Two, not just one, two examples of that in the same talk. We were actually talking about it on the way to church today. <laughs> All right. So, hey, next point. Learn to resolve conflict well. Huh? Perfect. Because we're going to mess up. We're going to blow it. So you know what, though? Learn over time to love the person so that you can come with your complaints. Right? Make it a great experience when they come to you to complain because otherwise if they don't, they'll shut down. Right? If I can't come to my spouse and say something's bothering me, then I just harbor it and I keep, keep it in, keep it in until what? Boom. Then it explodes. 
Meet the four greatest needs of a man and a woman. All right? This is just, this is marriage seminar 101. Sorry. It's just like, hey, if man's needs, very simple. What are they? <laughs> no one wants to say it. All right. Sex, sex. No, just kidding. So sex, fun, fun sex. No. All right. So sex, fun, respect, and a welcoming home type of thing, okay? Um, for women, usually number one is security, communication, leadership, and affection. You know what sex and affection do? This. Think about that. Why does God say to abstain? Oh, I could just keep going on and on. Why do you think? It's like, because men don't know how to be affectionate. We just don't. We go from kissing to something else. There's not a lot of hand-holding. You understand? That's how we're wired. But women just need a caress, need a hold, a hug, someone to talk to. Okay? So if we don't learn how to treat women with respect and dignity in the dating phase... Then when we get married, we're going to clash because they're one of their greatest needs is affection. One of a man's greatest needs is sex. All right. And then know their love language. If you don't know your love language right now, here they are. There's five. Quality time, gifts, words of affirmation, acts of service, physical touch. If you don't know what your, your spouse's love language is, you're probably not going to be able to love very well. Okay. Fourth investment. Got to move. Discover your purpose and develop your character. So Aline was sharing it on the, on the other half of life. But if you need to discover it in the first half, here's what they do in the studies. From age 20 to 40 is the discovery phase where you're trying different things. You're trying to figure out what you're good at. You're trying to figure out um, what your passions are, what you like. So try a lot of different things. But from 40 to 60 is your groove. This is the place where you understand who you are. You know how you're wired. You know what your gifts are. And now you're using them and living in them. And life in those 20 years should be just awesome, right? You're in it. And then 60 and on is the mentor stage. It's the giving back stage. It's like I've learned all these things in those 20 years. Now I want to pour them back into the next generation. And you go into like more of a coaching mentor type role. I mean, those are generalities, but that's basically um, what the studies show. So in discovering that, I put in develop your character. And let me just hit on that just for a second. A good list is found in Galatians, the book of Galatians, chapter 5, I believe. And it's the nine fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-discipline. I think those are the nine. Those are great character traits. Those are the things that if you 